Today I'm going to talk to you about something that many of us stick our head in the sand and act like we do not have the problem. I can see somebody else has a problem, but when we look at the topic that we're going to be talking about today, we have a national problem, we have a church problem, we have a family problem, in many cases we have an individual problem. Many cases, the reason why churches and individuals in the church struggle so much is that they are absolutely covered up in debt. Uh-oh. Oh, he preaching on money. But you know what? When money becomes the issue, everything is an issue. When you're arguing about something and you have no resources, you want something and you have no resources, you desire to do something or to go someplace, but you pay, can't put gas in the car, it frustrates you to a point that everything else falls apart. I'll tell you, many divorces take place not because they are not compatible, it's because they have opposite spending and saving issues. And it is a domino effect in relationships. But here's what God has given to us. God has given to us multiple scriptures about how to deal with debt, how to deal with resources. Now, I am one of those pastors that I absolutely try to hide from preaching on giving and tithing and money. Because I'm, I was the type of person that when my dad went to church, every time he went to church, which was once a few times, they would hit on tithing. They'd hit on giving. He goes, it's all the church wants. It's all the church wants. And I tell you, that is what this church wants. This church wants the members of the church to be financially healthy. When we the body of Christ, are financially healthy. It could change the evangelism of South Wichita. So I have some scriptures, and I want you to bear with me, because at the end, I want to give to you a three-fold cycle that if we would put into our lives these three principles and cycle them into our lives, I guarantee you it will help every area of your life, not only financial, social, relational, and even intellectual, when we understand what God wants to do through us. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 11. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a couple statements right after before. This is the Word of God. This Word of God is God-breathed. The Holy Spirit of God breathed this word for us, to do, for us today. God would never put anything into his word that he hasn't done or he has not promised he would do. So when the scripture says this is what God wants for us, we can take this. This is not a suggestion. This is God's mandate for the body of Christ. This is God's mandate for us. And when we look at this, you're saying, I'm struggling in this area. There may be all kinds of struggles that you have going on. So what do we do? What does God say? What does the word of God say? How can I take God's word and apply it to my life and fix the issues that I have? And it says this starting in verse six. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart. Verse seven, get that one again. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in a response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully out of the heart. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely, they gave generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides the seeds for the farmer and the bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resources and then products a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, 
You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who are in need, they will thank God. What is all that about? That is talking about what we have. This principle is not for the poor. This principle is not for the rich. This principle is not for the ones that have plenty of money in the bank. This principle is disrespect, is no respecter of the amount of money that you hold in your hand. Whether you have a million dollars in the bank or you don't have a dollar in your wallet, it doesn't change the fact that the principle is the same. When God's word sets up and he says, this is what you must do, it is a godly principle. The principle of the harvest is obviously because we can see God's operation, his natural creation continuously. The farmer who sows a small will inevitably reap a very small harvest. The principle continues that a man who sows generously will have the opportunity for a generous harvest. Now, it is not necessarily talking a financial harvest. It is those that give. God will bless in every area of your life. If you have your Bibles, Galatians chapter six, verses seven and eight. Paul is saying something that's very strong here. He says, don't be misled. Paul is saying, guys, listen, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. God is justice, he is right. God's principles are true. He says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit of God. Everlasting life, the inner joy, that, that happiness when you know that, that God gave me the increase. God took care of me. In Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. People curse those who hoard their gain, but they bless the ones who sell in times of need. When I was, uh, this whole series, talking about the, the, the seeds and rooted in God, that all started a few weeks ago when I went to a conference. And in that conference, the one thing that they communicated to us, the, one of the biggest detriments of the church growth today is this issue of sowing seed, of planting seed. Less, if we get the idea of giving, there's, there's five things that our generation in this church are struggling with. And this is the, what they listed. The average church member struggles in these areas. The first thing is time. Everybody struggles with time, right? There's not enough time. You're always doing something that's busy. You get up early, you go to bed late, and you have to study, you gotta do this, you're doing classes. You're, we're always busy. So we're struggling with time. So to counteract the struggling of time, we can't say, my time is mine, my time is God's. What we must do is we must find some place to serve to volunteer. If we do not volunteer, if we do not serve others, our time is not God's, our time is ours. The second thing is resources. We all struggle with resources. So the counteractive to a struggle with resources is give, give. And the Bible calls it a tithe. If you have a dollar, 10 cents is God's. If you have $100, $10 is God's. It's not a respecter of persons. If you want God to richly bless you, you have to give. Knowledge, sometimes the churches are struggling because the church doesn't have knowledge. What we have to do is we have to study. We have to put God's word into our head, into our hearts, and not just learn it, but to do it. And the biggest issue that struggles today in our culture is this, the desire to have more. Live within our means. In our culture, if we do not live within our means, we are surely going to be devastated. And that's why Galatians says, if we only give and invest into our sinful desires, in the things that we want and not in the things of God, we are going to surely be cast down. So unselfishness equals God's love 
to an unselfish giver. When we become unselfish, when we start thinking of what God would want me to do, God loves an unselfish giver. It, it says a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver it means I'm giving out of my heart. I want God to bless me. Verse seven, it says this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Did you take that last phrase? For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. It's not the amount that you give. It's the attitude of what you give. Why do I give? Generosity is God's selflessness worked out in your life. God's selflessness. He died on the cross. He gave his life. His selflessness has worked out for you. He has given to you much more than the resources. He's given to you a life. So what is the secret of that success? Very simple. Plant sparingly and you will reap sparingly. But plant generously and you will reap generously. Give what your heart tells you to give because God loves a cheerful heart. He loves somebody that has a passion for God and a passion for his work. When we promise God our life, when we go back to the day that we gave Jesus Christ our life and we say, Lord, I understand that I'm a sinner and I understand that I can't get to heaven on you without you and I, I, I apologize and I am a sinner, please forgive me. When we understand that God does supernatural things within our life, one of the things that he does within our life, he gives us resources and availabilities within our life to attach our heart and our soul to him. And one of the things that tell us whether we are a immature believer or we are a mature believer is this. It started back in Exodus chapter 36. They were wandering in the wilderness and uh, God spoke to Moses. And God said, I would like to dwell in the midst of my people. And he said, he said, I want you to build my tabernacle and I want it to be like this and gave him the blueprints and gave him all the needs that he had. And Moses was excited. So he set up and he had a meeting with everyone. And he said, guys, he said, God, God wants to be with us. He wants to dwell with us. We get to worship him. And he said, here's what we're going to do. In the morning, I need you to bring everything that you have. I need some gold. I need some silver. I need the wood. I need everything in order to build the temple. That next morning, the people continued to come and continued to bring stuff and continued to bring stuff. And in, in Exodus chapter 36, verses 3 through 7, this is the conclusion of the matter. God said, I want to be here. Moses communicated to the people, and this is what the people did. Moses gave them the materials donated by the people of Israel and, scare, and sacrificed offering for the completion of the sanctuary. But the people continued to bring additional gifts each morning. Finally, the craftsmen who were working on the sanctuary left their work. They went to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. When you hear what God needs, and it moves your heart, and you'll sacrifice a little, or you'll give because you see the need, what it does, it pleases the very heart of God when God's people says, I want to honor God because God loves me. Out of his full and abundant resources, God is able to bless you in all things, at all times, with all that you need to fill you with all that is good. He has an abundance of resources. Now, how do we know what God's resources are. Out of the abundance of heaven, out of the abundance of God creating this world, he owns everything within the world. Verse eight, and God will generously provide all you need. We have a weird perception of need and want, don't we? 
but everything that you need and plenty left over to share with others. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food for my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out as much blessing that you will not have room enough to handle it. Where, why do we get that? How do we understand that? In Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, with man, it is impossible. But with God, how much is possible? All. All things are possible with God. There's also a story in the Old Testament about Elijah and, and uh, this little widow woman that had a son. And Elijah came up to her house and he was weary and he was proclaiming the message and, and uh, this little widow woman had just enough in her barrel to make one more dinner. And Elijah said, ma'am, would you please uh, make me a, a dinner? And she said, I only have enough for me and my son and after this my son and I will perish because there's no more meal. And Elijah prayed to God and Elijah told her, would you please Make me this meal, and I will promise you the God of heaven will never allow you to go hungry, and the barrel will never be empty. Sometimes we have to trust that God's going to do the supernatural, because in ours, we don't understand that. But with God, God can take what we do not have and give to us what he wants us to have. Take, a, take the little boy feeding the 5,000, these little loaves and fish, he said, he said, here's what I have. He gave it to Philip, and Philip said, this is what we have left. And everybody ate, and they had 12 baskets of food left over. What God gave this little boy in return was basketfuls of food. He learned the ability to say, this is all I have. This is what I have. And then we can see what God can do with what we are willing to give to him. Give what you have and God will make sure you never run out. God will replenish your seed. Verse nine, I'm sorry, chapter nine, verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous and when we take your gifts to those who need, they will thank God. Give God the blessing. You know, there's a couple numbers. If I would say call 911, what does that mean? There's an emergency, right? Chad would be getting down here, call 911, there's something going on, we have an emergency. But if I say call 411, what does that mean? I need information. I believe God would like for us to call 411 once in a while. Sometimes our only phone call that we give is 911, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I'm hurting. I need your help. But before the hurting takes place, we could call God up and say 411 and say, Lord, I just, what do you want me to do? I need some information. When we talk about that, there's a cycle. If we get nothing else by the end of the year, if you would remember this three phase cycle, it can transform your finances. It could transform your relationships. It could transform your education. Because we have to understand that God wants to bless you. Not necessarily financially, but he wants to bless you because you are his child. So when we do this, here's phase one. Recognize the giver. Very simple. Recognize the giver. He is the giver of all. Because... He owns it all. When we understand he's the giver of all because he owns it all, I can't get it without him, we can realize I can't do this without you. You own everything. You have everything. Reminds me of a 
story of a, two little boys, about five or six years old boys, and they went to stay with Grandpa and Grandma for a night. And uh, have you ever spent the night with Grandpa and Grandma? Kind of like Al and Shirley, you know, they're getting up in years, and Al can hardly hear. And, and their little two grandsons come up, and, and they start talking. And so they get ready to go to bed, and they kneel beside the bed, and their grandson says, Dear Father, please give to me a new iPad. Dear Father, I would like a new bicycle. And the other little boy says, God's not deaf. He said, yeah, but Grandpa is. <laughs> and sometimes we want to pray as God is like little Grandpa, that if we pray loud enough and long enough, God is going to be our Santa Claus, and he wants to give to us everything. But we have to realize God owns everything. And when we understand that God owns everything, we recognize where it comes from. Sometimes at the end of the cycle, we say, look how good I am. I got the promotion because I am good. My investments tripled because I invested properly. We have to realize if we are a child of God, everything that God gave to us is from him. If we realize that, God can do great things through us. In Haggai 2, 8, it says, the silver and the gold are mine, says the Lord. In Psalms 24, 1, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything. First, we have to recognize the giver. Not, we have to realize that God owns everything. The principle is everything I have is God's. My talent was given me from God. My work ethic was given to me by God. My resources were given to me by God, maybe because of my work ethic, maybe because of my talent, maybe because of a blessing, but everything that I have, I have to recognize that God is the giver, not me. When we think I, that's selfish. When we think I can do it and I deserve it, that's when we fail. He is the giver of it all because he is the owner of it all. Remember phase one. Phase two, reinvest the gift. You reap sowingly. If you sow sowingly, sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. So what we have to do is when God blesses, we must invest. Reinvest the gift. Never put it to your use. Use your resources, your talent, your monies into God's work so he can do great things. True happiness is this. Jesus, freely you have received, freely give. If we understand, recognize that God is the giver and God is blessing me, I need to reinvest the gift, whatever that gift would be. The rich fool Jesus calls one man a fool in the Bible. And he says we shouldn't call anybody a fool, but, but this guy was called a fool. He was a farmer. And he planted his seeds. And the harvest was great, the greatest harvest he's ever had. And he brought all of his harvest in. He said, he said I don't have enough room for the harvest. I'm going to tear down these barns. I'm going to get bigger barns. I'm going to get new green tractors. And I'm going I'm to have everything that I want. I'm going to be in love with my John Deere tractor. And I'm going to buy and sell. And I'm going to make these gigantic barns. And after I get done, I'm going to step back. I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. And I'm just going to be merry because I have enough. And he went to bed that night with a smile on his face because of the resources he had. And he heard the drapes. And he heard a voice. And God visited him that day. And he said this, he said, you fool. Tonight, your soul is going to be required of you. And he asked this, and then what about your resources? What good is it to have everything at your disposal? that I blessed you with and you keep it to yourself so I can have more, so I can do greater things. He said, what we must do is when we have increase, we must invest, reinvest the gift, reinvest what we have. 
And the Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 21, we need to be rich towards God. Not rich towards man, rich towards God. Winston Churchill said this, one of his most popular quotes. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We all make a living. We all get a paycheck. We all trade off our time for money. And we think that when I trade off the time with money, what I get is mine. But we make a life by what we give. What we give to others and what we give to God. It is totally important. Verse 11. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you cannot always be generous. So you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who are in need, they will thank God. When we give God the glory, we understand who gave us the increase, and we give and serve and give to others, and we can say, God did this for me. God will bless me. God takes care of every issue of my life. Ed Gunger said this, giving touches a nerve in us that nothing else does. We look at it a lot like what God would do. When you give, you defy the fear that you won't have enough. You insult greed, the impulse to acquire, you possess more than one needs or deserves. If you really believe that God owns it all and that is your source and provider giving all that simple matter, the arena of giving is the only place where exactly what's going on in your heart is revealed. According to Jesus, giving keeps your heart's motion towards God away from the material things. Your heart will follow the direction of your giving. It is the only place outward expression is shown from the heart. When I have a cheerful heart, when I have a giving heart, when I want to be rich towards God, it is evident in the way I perceive my resources. When I see my resources as one that God owns and God's working and God's planning, then what happens is the third thing. I understand where it comes from. I understand I need to invest. And then reap the gain. Reap the gain. What does that mean? That means God blesses you for a purpose. When we understand where everything comes from, and I understand who's the giver, and I understand that once I receive from God, I'm going to invest in God's work, in God's kingdom, and I'm going to be rich towards God. I get to reap the gain. I get to reap the gain. All who consecrated soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power, and the inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at your command when we ask God to bless us, when we reinvest what God has given to us back into his work. You can never outgive a holy God. You can never outgive your father. Abba, Father, he wants to bless you and honor you. Everything that God could do was done to save a perishing world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has made it impossible for it to be said that he could have done more than he has done for a fallen race. When he gave his son, he gave himself. In one great gift, he poured out the whole treasures of heaven and has revealed a love that defies all comprehension, a love that should fill our hearts and lives with gratitude, a heart that should fill our hearts and lives with with gratitude. And then in verse 15, thank God for the gift too wonderful for words. You know what that gift is? There's one word. It's called Calvary. When we put everything in perspective, we sacrifice the salvation, the love, and the forgiveness the grace, the long-suffering, the heavens. Because sometimes we forget what Jesus did. Sometimes we want the resources and we want the blessings of God, but we forget Calvary. Sometimes we want to sacrifice and get 
so I can have bigger and more and better and we could care less about being rich towards God. Uh, see, I'm one of those pastors that I believe I have failed. I have failed in a generational thing because of my fear on speaking on resources. We have a generation that's coming up that has no knowledge of what the Bible truly says about gifts, about our ties, about our resources, about everything that I have is of God's. But you could talk to any generation that has a passion for God, that has been giving back to God, and God has blessed them, and God has used them in a miraculous way, and you would say, you can't outgive God. Not only in our resources, but also in God's protection, in God's love, in God's direction within your life. When we have a passion for God and I want to be rich towards God, I want to send everything I have up to God. I want to send my family up to God. I want to send my resources up to God. I want to send everything that I have ever touched to be rich towards God. So here's the cycle recognize the giver, reinvest the gift. Reap the game. Recognize the giver. Reinvest the gift. Reap the game. Recognize the giver. Non-ending. Here's what we do. We understand that God owns it. He's the creator of the world. And then we understand that sometimes I have a little bit left over. But instead of giving to be rich towards God, we get rich towards self. And there's a break in the way that the cycle works. When we keep ourselves and we don't give God what it is, and he owns it all, we understand he's the giver, he's the owner of it, but we say, God, not this time. This one's mine. I work too hard for this. I'm going to keep it myself. What you're saying to God, without saying it, God, you don't matter. I don't need you. I got this one myself. I have worked hard. I have studied. I have prepared. I got this. I don't need you. And what we have done, we have severed the blessing of God. Because when we reinvest it, we have to reinvest back to God. You have to give to yourself. You have to save for your future. But everything that you have is not yours. Everything you have is God's. And God has said, all I want is that 10. You can have the rest and give God the glory in everything that you do. And then what we do is if we continue to do that, we get to reap the gain. Because we reinvest it. We reap the gain. All of a sudden, God has blessed us. God has done things for us that we can't comprehend. God has protected us in ways that we have no idea. God has given to us resources that we don't understand. And we can reap the gain if we do this. We give God what he wants what he's asked for, we can keep 90% to ourselves. And what we do is we say, thank you, God, for giving to me what you've given to me. I want to honor you. I want to be rich towards you. And God says, that is an understanding of the process of the harvest. If you reap sparingly, it is because you sowed sparingly. It's because you took your eyes off of the plan and put your eyes on what I have. And listen, many of you, many of us, we could say, you know, we can pay our rent this month. We have our car payment covered. But a lot of us probably don't have the, the six months investments into the bank, so if I lost my job for six months, I can have it covered. I wish Dave Ramsey was all the way across the board and everybody understands everything that Dave Ramsey says. But here's the issue. You will never get to that point unless you put God where he needs to be in your life. It is not a matter of I can be successful because I am good. It is a matter is I've got to honor God because he is good. And he can open up the floodgates of heaven and do things for you that you can't do on your own. It is not a principle of work, work, work to get, get, get. It's a principle of give so God can bless. Give because God's word says it. Give as a cheerful heart, not because I have to out of, ne out of neglect or because somebody's telling me to. It's a passion for God. It's a love for God. And when I have a passion and a love for God and I understand God owns everything, I used this illustration uh, in my office right before we had a, um, a, a little baby in the office. And, and I asked uh, Wayne, I said, uh, how, much, 
How much for the little baby? Can I, can I buy your little baby? He said, no, I can't. You can't buy my baby. I said, I said How, give me a price. Not for sale. We could put a price tag, nothing on any price I would ever sell my child for. Now, there's days that you could rent them out maybe <laughs> weeks or so. But our kids are ours. And these brand new little babies that come up here and they say, Bruce, could we dedicate my child? They would never give a, take a, take a million dollars for that child, but they want God's blessing upon that child. And in our resources, in our relationships, we should lay them at the altar and say, my resources are yours. My debt is yours. I can't get out of this hole. My debt is so great, I can't get out of this hole. I need you. And God, as the investment counselor, would say this. Put some over here. Put some over here. Put some to be rich towards God. And let God do the supernatural work to bless your life, to get you out of debt. You can't get out of debt on your own. You can't invest enough in your finances. You have to invest in the principle of the, wa of the, of the seed, in the harvest, towards God. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus in my life and God's blessing in my life than anything. There's an old song that I've asked Justin to sing. And I want us to contemplate the words to that song. Now, here's the deal. I don't want you to sing the song because you like the tune. Because sometimes we get up here and we sing songs and you're saying, what does that mean? Or we're saying things that I do not mean. This song, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. The idea of the song is that we give out of the heart. God blesses us out of the heart. God takes care of us because we understand that God is the priority, not me. To my finances, to my debt, God looks at my debt and says, <laughs> okay, I can handle that. Can you handle that? If you give that debt to me, is that debt going to be back next month? Or are you going to learn what I've done for you? I'm not going to give to you the blessings of heaven if you're going to use it for your good. I'm going to get you out of debt. I'm going to bless you because I want you to honor me in doing that. And when we become rich towards God, that means we become mature in Christ. That means we are learning that we're not using our resources for self. We're using our resources for God and God will open up the floodgates of heaven. The Bible says in Malachi that he will even rebuke the devourer. He's gonna keep Satan away from your life. He's gonna get rid of the stuff within your life that's gonna cause havoc within your life. But we have to have a passion, a love for Jesus. This old song, I want you to listen to the first verse and not even sing it. I want you to listen to the words that was written many years ago, but it has some power words behind it. And then we're done singing the song. I'm gonna ask us to do something as a financial counselor would do. We have to name our issue. We have to name our debt. We have to name who we rely on. We have to name it and identify with it and put our head out of the sand and say, there's no way I'm gonna be able to deal with it until I can first claim it, understand God is owner of it, and I'm gonna give it to him. And then put principles into action because it does no good at all. If somebody has a, a $2,000 house payment and they come up to you and say, can I borrow $2,000? I don't have any money. And I say, yeah, I'll, I'll let you have $2,000. I give them $2,000, gave it to them. They make their house payment. But nothing changes within their life. Guess what? Next month's going to come up. $2,000 house payment. They're going to come up. Hey, dude. No, 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 no. Until you make changes, I'm not going to invest within your life anymore. 
And so often we ask God to give me, give me, give me, and give me. And God is saying, I want to bless you, but what I want you to do is I want you to learn, change, put some things into action that's going to change the outcome. And the only way that you're going to do is to trust in me, allow me to bless you, allow me to take care of you, and the outcome can be different. But you have to have a passion and a love for Jesus.